Hi everyone and welcome to the Viamonstra Academy office hours. This is where you can ask questions on anything related to MDT, Config Manager, Intune, good deal of PowerShell, imaging, Windows servers, pretty much anything Microsoft infrastructure these days. My name is Johan and I'll be your host for the next hour here. And that being said, please let the questions roll in. Right there, excellent. So uh, there was the first question was regarding a blog post I put out uh, just yesterday. Uh, was regarding um, uh, getting Dart going to reset um, to use the name and password. And to give you some context, I can go ahead and switch over to my demo there and. Uh, now it's not that one, but this post here, the ability to reset the Windows admin password using Dart. So Dart, for those of you who haven't stumbled across it earlier, is part of the Microsoft Desktop Optimization Pack. It's been available for many, many years. The latest version is actually 2015. So it has been around for a long time, but it still works. It still works in Windows 10. Uh, when you work with Dart, you have the option of, once you boot up the machine, you have the option to do some uh, diagnostic of that tool. It's there to basically diagnose and repair uh, Windows, typically a Windows machine that doesn't start very well or is not happy to start. But one tool that it does allow you to do is to reset the local admin password. So to install Dart is fairly straightforward. Um, I recommend that you find a machine of the same version of Windows that you're planning on working with, uh, especially when pointing Dart to where to get the, the, the media, etc. So what I have here that I was using when I was uh, playing around with the blog post or writing the blog post, let's see where I put that one. It was this machine here. So this is a regular Windows machine. I simply installed Dart from the ISO directly. So in the um, MDOP media that you download, so MDOP 2015 media. If you check in that folder structure, what you get is Dart, you have Dart 10, you have installers, you have the language. So I simply installed the uh, Dart MSI on an existing Windows machine. And when you do that, when you run through that installer, you get on the start menu, you get a few different tools. You have the remote connection viewer that you use for imaging and troubleshooting that, but you also have the dot recover image wizard. So when you run this wizard, it's going to ask you to provide uh, a media, and that should be the Windows 10 version you are about to recover. Often it will work with uh, like you can use a 21H2 to recover a 20H2, but to make sure in this case, I just want to make sure I was the same version of Windows. So what I mounted here to do this, run this wizard, I simply mounted because I was troubleshooting a Windows 10 21H, sorry, 20H2. So I used that media. So I mounted that media now onto my server. So that will be the, the D drive is my Windows 10 ISO. So I continue with this one. I select the 64-bit one and I specify a folder to which where I have my Windows 10 installation media. And then I simply go ahead and click Next. Uh, I tell it what option I want to have available in a recovery image. In this case, I selected everything. And then if I should allow remote connections, etc. yes or no. And then uh, add in additional drivers. Uh, you can also add in additional uh, files to WinP, additional components. But in this case, I didn't add any. And then it just creates an ISO file, in this case, on my desktop. So it also creates a PowerShell script that I can use to rerun this uh, later. But what this one creates, obviously, is on my desktop. When I run through this, I got an ISO file here uh, that I can use. Or I can take the boot with him and add to my Pixie server, WDS, iPixie, whatever you're using, and I can Pixie boot that recovery media that way. So 
So if I go to a merge machine that would like to reset the password on, let's see what I can find there that I can reset the password on. <laughs> Maybe. Let's see what this one here does. Well, that was a Windows 11 one. Let's borrow this one here. But this uh, is supposed to be media where I simply have forgot my, my password to the admin account. Uh, it doesn't work, I don't have the password. So now I can mount this virtual machine on that ISO, which I copied over here. And then I simply restart this machine and I shall make sure I actually have so it can boot from a DVD rather than uh, the media here. So let me just restart this one. Start from the media. It should be mounted. Would I like to start network? Yeah, sure. Language. Uh, troubleshoot, diagnostics, recovery tool set, Windows 10, uh, locksmith in this case, and, and now I can go ahead and uh, provide a new password to this machine. Uh, next, next finish, and I have a new password. The next time I boot, I will prompt it to generate a new password one again, but I have to use this one to gain access to the machine in the first place. So that's how this tool works. You install it on a different machine, you generate the media, you boot the machine that you need to recover on that media, and then it allows you to go in and, and specify a new password here. So pretty useful. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen the blog post, I'll put the link up in the chat here. And uh, that's pretty much it. Very, very useful tool. I saved my, I wouldn't say life, but <laughs> uh, it's very helpful over the years, uh, for sure. The trick is to install a tool on a working machine that actually can log into, not on the machine that you're trying to get the new password on. All right. I uh, got a comment about not seeing the video. I checked earlier and I could see it on the Twitter stream, at least. Yeah, that one looks like it's uh, okay. It might be something that is up with LinkedIn at the moment. Um, we do have a stream going on on Twitter as well as well as Facebook, as well as YouTube. So if LinkedIn is giving you a hard time at the moment, uh, uh, maybe switch to one of those. Uh, sorry about that. I have no idea why the LinkedIn one is not OK. Let's see if I can go over and just launch LinkedIn real quick on a browser next to me. Um, just to see if I see something. It actually does show up nicely on LinkedIn for me. Um, so hopefully it should be okay now. I have no idea what happened there earlier, but we have the same stream going out in, in four different channels. So usually if you see it in one place, you see it in others, but all right. Uh, and I got some confirmation from a few others as well here in the chat that you can see the stream. So great, excellent. Okay. Um, any other questions? Happy to answer.
So the request in here in the Zoom call, is there any documentation that I can provide to a customer regarding the company portal running as a broker app? They scrutinize every app and want to know what it does. Uh, well, first of all, the company portal changed just recently. Uh, I don't, I haven't, I haven't seen any like core documentation on of like the company portal in internals. I, I have not. There might be around somewhere, but I haven't uh, stumbled across it. It's more like software center in, in config manager basically, but it allows users to do some basic changes on the machine as well as install applications or if you info about the machine as well as start applications that you have deployed through Intune uh, to the device or to the user. But uh, as far as link, I'm sorry, I don't have one. All right. So another question here in the Zoom call, is Dart the same tool as the MSDT that Microsoft had a vulnerability? No, it's not the same tool. So Dart is this one here that belongs to uh, the MDOT piece. Uh, the other one is the, um, I have a CV on this one recently, which they fixed with a hot fix. Uh, 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 let's see if I can find that post. Mm -hmm. Not there. Saw a post just recently about it. But they're not the same. Uh, here we go. This was the vulnerability that was raised in late Mar uh, late May. Uh, so this is the, their own diagnostics tool, which is different from Dart. But this one has been patched now. Um, uh, uh, yesterday, patch Tuesday. I'll get patching. All right, any other questions? We have a whooping forty five minutes to spare. While we are waiting, uh, we did an event yesterday. Uh, Richard Hicks uh, spent some time with us on Always On VPN. That recording is now available. So we just added it up this morning uh, to the site. So if you missed this uh, Always On VPN training, uh, the recordings are available and it's free to, to enroll and, and view that course. Uh, the best information you can find on Always on VPN by far. Richard is a legend in this area. All right. Any other questions? Any questions at all? I'll be waiting for more questions to come in. Uh, I do like to uh, like to highlight that 
Microsoft has released a new version of ADK for Windows 11, meaning 22H2. Uh, what I learned so far is that it's not quite just yet production ready. Uh, even with the latest config manager 2203, it happens to work, but it's not supported by the team, meaning they haven't fully tested it yet uh, in the current version of config manager. Uh, in terms of MDT, uh, it didn't work at all. So for those of you using MDT Light Touch, for now I recommend to uh, stay away a little bit from the 22H2 uh, ADK. Uh, because there seems to be some sort of conflict there. I haven't quite figured out what yet. I just realized that it was not happy. If you're lucky, it is as simple as a file being missing. That would not be the first time in the ADK history where Microsoft simply forgot to add a file for one of their components and that broke the component. So, but more on that later, I will update this blog post if I have any more information. Uh, for those of you using the PowerShell deployment kit, I've been successful using that one with 22H2, so that seems to work fine. So it only seems to be some sort of issue on either VBScript or HDA or both uh, in this version. So for production usage right now, I recommend to stick with the uh, 21H2 version uh, because that one uh, works just fine even with uh, Windows 10 and Server 22 deployment, etc. So, um, it was a fun research project this weekend. Play around with that one. All right, I put the link there in the chat as well. Any other questions? Or any questions at all? Uh, yes, I was trying out the new hydration kit, had in some problems not getting the domain controller to have a domain. Well, that's uh, that's definitely not intended. Um, I would have to have a little bit more information to be able to answer why that is. Uh, the most common reason I've seen is that uh, a, a driver is missing, uh, but that's quite rare if you're using virtual machines. I uh, usually have it always. So I will more or less have to, to get either log files from that machine or get a copy of the hydration ISO so I can try it out myself in, in my virtual machine. But the hydration kit, we test quite frequently. Uh, many people are using them. Uh, they're not bug free, of course. <laughs> I don't uh, claim that, but uh, usually the domain control installs just fine as long as it has a network. Uh, to connect to uh, or use. Um, one thing I've seen happen is uh, the image that is being used, uh, it needs to be a, a desktop image for the hydration to work, so it cannot be a core index, so it doesn't work with standard core or data center core for that matter, so it has to be the desktop experience index. Um, my recommendation would be to just try to get a new server image in that kit and see if that solves the problem. So basically just uh, take one of the kits here and go to the script that extracts uh, the image. And uh, make sure it gets the desktop experience windows or from it to the WIM file. Other than that, please drop me an email or send a D on Twitter or message on LinkedIn and I can help you offline figuring out why it didn't become a domain controller. All right, uh, there's another question on YouTube coming in. Uh, Best practices to ADR for Windows 10 11 with examples. That's a long story. Uh, it's typically it's one of those. It depends on uh, how you use software updates in your environment. 
I mean, the, the basic concept is, uh, is quite simple. When you create your ADRs uh, on the platform, uh, I do recommend to separate Office updates from client updates because these packages can be fairly big depending on how much you need to update. And what I found over the years is that the deployment packages get, get too large and you can go ahead and see the size here on, on how big they are. Uh, if they start to hit 30, 40 gigs, config managers sometimes have troubles distributing those. And if they go to 100 gig, almost impossible to get them distributed effectively. It's not from the client side, because the client is only going to download what it needs from the package, but config manager kind of needs to distribute these packages out to all the distribution points. So I do recommend to segment out. Uh, and you do you know, servers, you have a separate one for servers as well. Um, other than that, it's more like only synchronize what you actually uh, need uh, in those rules. So I do keep a separate packet for them and make them available. Um, but other than that, um, if you don't support 32-bit, don't download 32-bit. If you don't support Titanium or ARM, don't download them because right now I'm effectively cutting the download size in half by not adding in 32-bit. Uh, depending on what you're synchronizing, you have an older version of Windows 10, make sure you don't synchronize updates for those. That's a good recommendation. And when you're looking for updates, look at least two months back because sometimes Microsoft will um, close an update before it's ready to be closed. So if you have a machine that wasn't updated last month, if they miss an update, then things can happen. But there are plenty of decent guidelines out there on, on how to set up uh, ADRs uh, for Config Manager, uh, for sure. Um, shameless plug, obviously, uh, do have a, a Config Manager operations course and here on the academy and one of the modules is software updates so we spend time going through that end-to-end -end scenarios so uh, if you want to join that course in Q3 I'll be happy to to see you there but um, yeah that was that so let's see what else uh, there's a question coming in on YouTube when planning a move to your config manager environment to new hardware. Would it be viable to stand up a passive site and then promote the new site to active? I am not the biggest fan of the high availability options in config manager. Uh, so far, they have been causing me more grief than they were supposed to save me from. So. In terms of uh, like failover and high availability, that's usually just restore the backup if something happens. So I like the idea of having a single primary site and if something happens to it, the server dies, whatever, I restore the backup and I'm back in business in, in usually less than uh, two hours. And for most organization, they won't even notice that the server was down for two hours. If you're talking about migrating to a new OS version, uh, we talked about that many times here on the uh, Academy Office Hours, but even though uh, Config Manager and uh, Microsoft in general uh, does support that you do in place upgrades of the OS on the server itself, I, I don't like it. I have seen too many times where I would stumble across something like six months down the road, a problem that can only be related to that I earlier did an in-place upgrade of the platform. What I prefer if I need to migrate my site server to a new OS is to spin up a new server and do a backup restore. Uh, that process is fairly quick. Uh, you get it done in less than a day if you practice a little bit. And uh, then you have a brand new setup, but you have all your data uh, intact. 
And since we're doing a backup or restore, you can play around with this in lab environments and test things. It, it's not too, too complicated. Uh, as I've showed probably five times already here in the academy, but Jason Sandis, uh, former Microsoft MVP, and now uh, they, they work for Microsoft. But if you search his uh, blog for backup, you have one of the best step-by-step uh, -step guide there is for this, where you indeed have an old server, you want to go to a new server. Um, so this is a good guide. I put the link in the chat for you. And uh, this is how I prefer to do it. All right. Uh, Bill, who is joining here in the Zoom call, uh, had a question. Let's see. Uh, any additional news on Internet Explorer end of life today? Uh, haven't seen anything on Twitter. Uh, the more than people more or less celebrating that it is the end of day for, for Internet Explorer. Uh, a fun fact that I uh, stumbled across this morning was that, that uh, IE7 uh, is still supported for uh, 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 until uh, 2023, but for embedded. Because embedded has its own little life cycles. So I just thought that was a fun thing that showed up in the Twitter sphere. Uh, so scratch that one, I is gone. Uh, so, anyhow. Uh, let's see what other questions come in. Uh, can we build custom images for all the automated? Uh, absolutely, yes. That was a question from Matt here in, in the Zoom call. Uh, having image uh, builds automated uh, is called having uh, an image factory, basically. If I go back here, uh, it's more a concept than a technical solution. What it, uh, what it basically means is that it doesn't matter if you are building thin images or updating thin images, or if you're building images where you actually put some applications in it because you work in an education environment or, or something where you need to deploy a lab real quick and you simply must. Uh, no matter what type of images they create, they, they should be automated. Uh, the build should be automated. And if you're building uh, thin images, uh, I recommend a bit of PowerShell. We have showcased uh, many different solutions uh, uh, in these office hours earlier. The most common one is, for example, that script I referred to earlier, which basically just grabs the Microsoft ISO and extracts the index that I want. That's a quick way to automate the build of a thin image with the WIM file you want. There are great tools like OSD Builder. So uh, from David Segura, let's see if I put that one, not there. Da, da, da. Not there either. I have a lot of different machines floating around. This one maybe. Yeah, so this is David's PowerShell module. You install it, mount the ISO to run the update, and uh, 45 minutes later, you have an updated media. It's a thin media, but it's fully fully updated to wherever you need to, to build it for. This was the latest one I was running. This was a 21H2 image that I was uh, getting updates for. This was down here, Windows 1909, I was playing around with. But this is just an elegant module to, to uh, get it done. So David has that module up here on uh, OS the Builder. Whoops. So it's the cloud. But this is a great tool to create thin images. It can also remove uh, 
how about say junk, but remove Windows components uh, from it if you need to. You can add in language packs and some other stuff, but uh, a great tool to create thin images. Uh, we have, as you also showcased here on the Academy, you have from uh, Donna Ryan, you have Wimwitch has been around for a good while. as a nice little GUI based tool that allow you to do the same thing. It also has some integration to Config Manager to uh, extend the console for that. And if you need to build thick images, I recommend to use MDT for it. Um, I do have uh, on my blog several posts on how to set up uh, this for was for Windows 11. This one here was for Windows 10. But basically, how to set up an MDT environment so that you can create sequences that does fully automated builds of Windows, all applications, and everything that is needed in a very, very automated fashion. So I'll put that link in the chat for you if you haven't seen it. But something that upsets me uh, more than it probably should be, I really don't like to see uh, a 10, 15, 20 page document with instructions on how to create an image. My strongest suggestion here is put that steps, those steps into a sequence so that you can build that image over and over every time and it gets equally good every single time. Uh, the reason I recommend MDT for it is because it's easy to automate. Uh, than the equivalent in Config Manager. I use Config Manager to deploy images, absolutely, but I don't build them in Config Manager. So PowerShell, so export scripts, uh, with the builder, or Winwich for that one, or for thick images, uh, I recommend automate MDT for it. Basically what it comes down to is if I need a new image of any kind, I open up a command prompt or PowerShell prompt. I find a folder. I run a script. I walk away. An hour later, a half hour later, there is a web file on the server ready to go. What this script basically does, creates a virtual machine, boots it, picks a sequence automatically, runs through the sequence that in the end will install all applications, all settings, and sysprep and capture it to a, a web file. So on the server end for this, uh, it is basically just a bunch of different sequences for different stuff. This is my 21H201. That was the OS. Here are my sequences. It's just a list of actions that needs to happen. And the sequence does all that every single time. So if you have a chance, use the images. It allows you to be very flexible. Uh, there are other techniques you can use to speed up deployment. Uh, like women applications and drivers and whatnot. But if you really need thick images, I think they should be automated too. Long story there. Uh, let's see. Question coming in on LinkedIn here. Um, Uh, question, have I done any imaging relating to iOS or Apple? Uh, I, I have not. Uh, let's see. Opening images originally from iOS or Apple, and if you can open them on Windows 10. I, I do not know. I, I have not tried. Uh, sorry about that. If anyone on the call on LinkedIn happens to see the question or the answer, please reply. But I, I, I don't have any, any idea at all, actually. Uh, 
Uh, Mark is asking regarding it was the builder uh, by adding patches to WinRE, WinP, and the install Win. Doesn't that make the image huge? No, it does not because David also does the cleanup. So the resulting image size is pretty much the same as the one that you download from Microsoft. Uh, wonder if I left that one behind. Maybe I did. Let me take a look. Yeah, so this is the, whoops, so this is the fully updated media after running OS the Builder. This one with uh, patches from May in it, so not the June updates yet, but the May updates in it. So that one is now 4.11 gigs in size, you can see it down here. Uh, the original WIM file, the ISO from Microsoft, uh, that I used as a source before patching, that WIM file is 4.49 because this one also contains all the other unused indexes. So David's media is actually smaller than what you download from Microsoft because it does extract all of the index you're using and it does some uh, good cleanup after applying those updates. Question though. I mean, we can do a comparison if I would, so this was a, this was an 1809. Apparently look at the wrong image here. Yeah, 4 to 32, so about the same. I was accidentally looking at the server image installed with him. So, no, it does not load those images uh, with data. Any other questions? 20 minutes to spare. So as a follow-up, the question is, uh, why would we update WinRE or WinPE? Uh, for the most time, the most normal deployments, you don't need to. And there are options in OS the Builder to skip updating WinPE and WinRE. If you are just using a WIM file for regular production deployment, you already have a WinP boot image, and that typically does not need to be updated. I've been in some rare cases over the years where a boot image needed a, a patch. I remember back in 1709, there was a driver's issue for some HP servers where you needed to have a CU applied to the boot image uh, to actually work. But when you use images for upgrades, for servicing, for full in-place upgrades, it's actually using, for example, WinRE. It's also using setup components, and they need to be updated. So David's solution does all that. Uh, so that's basically, you get the same functionality as you would if you had downloaded the ISO from Microsoft and used that one as is, but this tool makes it a little bit smaller and make sure it can stay always updated if you have trouble getting the ISO from Microsoft. Uh, for the current versions of Windows, Microsoft is pretty good in providing monthly updates. For all the versions, they don't. For example, if I would go to, to MSDN or my Visual Studio as it's called now and want to download, say, a Server 2016 media, the latest I can download is probably from some point somewhere last year, but I can use David's solution to bring it up to the current version, uh, which is very elegant. Even 2019, I don't think, is available every month now, these days. So, good stuff.
All right, any other questions? A few questions coming in here in the Zoom call. Um, do you have a direct link for Dart? Uh, so Dart, as I mentioned earlier, is part of MDOP. And MDOP is part of Software Assurance. So it's a licensed software. Um, it's part of Software Assurance. So if you have Software Assurance, you have it. So, so you download it from the volume license site as everything else. And there are other good stuff in this package as well. I um, know a lot of customers who are still doing Active Directory Group Policy, they're, for example, using the Advanced Group Policy Management so they can check out and check in policies and have version control and all that good stuff, approval processes for, uh, for group policies. And over the years, of course, a lot of folks have been using uh, MBAM before uh, the Config Manager team took over that and converted that into BitLocker Management. But um, yeah. MDOP is still supported until, I believe they extended it to April 2026, so even though it's older, it's still, still there, but there haven't been much work lately on it uh, at all. So, yeah, as uh, Thomas uh, uh, commenting here, I thought MDOP was, MDOP was deprecated. It's still available, still works. MBAM is still supported, but there has been little to no development of this uh, for the longest time. And I haven't seen any replacement at all for this yet. So this one is still being used. This one is still being used. But the recovery tool set, I haven't seen any uh, replacement for. Uh, I mean, if you do a Google search and search for Windows 10 password reset tools, there are other solutions out there. Uh, different versions of, of like hacking tools that, that will do a similar thing. Uh, but this is the only one I know of from Microsoft uh, that exists. If anyone has stumbled across something else, uh, let me know. I'll be happy to share it. But this is what I've been using when it reset an admin password on a box. There's another question coming in on the Zoom call. Uh, how to stop teams for auto start. Um, I haven't done much of testing that myself, but I have stumbled across a few people uh, figuring out how to get uh, teams not to launch with Windows and also how to remove the home edition from Windows 11 because Windows 11 comes with their own little version of, of, of teams. Um, Remember, Adam Gross did some work on that. Um, might have been Gary Block. Uh, no, it was Adam Gross. Uh, and it's been a bit of a pain this process. Um, what else? Um, Seem to be some related information in this. Uh, post here. Uh, 
Uh, I have not tried this one, but I'll put the link in the chat for you. See if it makes any sense. If anyone happened to know a fantastic way to prevent teams from auto launching, by all means, let me know. Uh, One might be good as well. Put it this way, as far usually knows what it talks about, so I would also recommend checking this one out. Uh, hopefully that can help. Let's see, that's not a question on LinkedIn here. Um, Mike was using IP filters instead of IP helpers for Pixie configuration. Do you know the path for the new native SCCN Pixie service? Oh, the boot path. Um, I'm assuming you refer to the SCP scope options. Uh, well, you set in the boot file name as an option 67. Um, I don't know, but I do have a, a new responder on this system. So this distribution point here is um, enabled with Pixie, but it is enabled with the uh, without WDS option. So it means in services I have the uh, on my DP, not on the server, uh, I have the config manager uh, Pixie responder running. This one has its uh, TFTP root in do do do. Let's see where we put that one. wonder what would be the path to specify. Assuming the same type of files. I have not tried setting the boot file name for this one, but it looks like it's a similar path to what it used to be. Meaning for slash boot slash 64 and then the, uh, the boot file name. You can find something clever on that. find the post explicitly for that. Uh, I guess it would be the same. But... Oh, 
Well, nothing that comes up on the top of on my search here. Um, if you drop me an email or, or send a message on LinkedIn, I can look into it because I am kind of intrigued about fixing service in general. Uh, I just usually use IP helpers and not so much scope options. Um, so yeah, please do that, and I'll, I'll look I'll look into it. Um, also, follow-up question regarding um, Dart. Basically, do you still use it other than Locksmith? Uh, yeah, I use uh, uh, the File Explorer when you're navigating through files, or I just open the dialog box from Notepad and browse around and find files. I also use the Remote Recovery a lot, the, the Connection Viewer, because that one allows me to remote into machines while they're being deployed, or even in WinPE. So I do have a blog post about that, because I don't like the way the Config Manager on MDT integration does it. I think it starts it's too late. Uh, so here is how you add it to your boot images. Uh, early so that you can remote into the machines even before typing in a pass pixie password for example um, but this one is still useful uh, if you cannot get access to dart because you don't have a, a mdop available uh, gary of course uh, has a nice post on using bnc for it uh, so that one is useful, and VNC is also cool because it also works for uh, clients on internet, so you can remote into uh, machines that way. Uh, you also have, and it was Gary Cody who gave me this tip on MS actually, it's a solution uh, from a guy that works from Intel called Mesh Central. That one will also allow to remote into WinPE, uh, even when that machine is behind a firewall on that device or is somebody's home, uh, stuff like that. So this seems to be promising as well. Uh, it is using Node.js. You need to pay attention for security there. But other than that, uh, it is open source. Uh, so. So this is good. <laughs> there was a follow-up comment here on the in the chat that Microsoft has another solution that is using the same uh, uh, acronym as Dart, and yes, unfortunately they do. Uh, so Dart is also this. But that's a very different Dart. Dart from MDOP is the recovery tools that I showed you earlier. But this one here is the sort of a new one, uh, the Dart with uh, basically this. It's the recovery tool set. Discuss the brilliancy of using the same acronym for two different things, but here we are. All right, any other questions? We have a good four minutes to spare. Right, I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, thank you everyone for joining. I hope to see you again 
next Wednesday, same time, same channel, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.